All right, good evening. Uh, my name is Kara Elbert, and I am on the City's Historic Preservation Commission and the City's Planning and Zoning Commission. And for work, I work for Northwest Iowa Planning and Development Commission here in Spencer. So um, thanks for coming this evening for this lecture as part of Historic Preservation Month, which takes place each May. This lecture is also part of the 150th celebration of Spencer that we're celebrating this year. This lecture is on who was George Spencer, presented by Steve Bongars. A special thank you to the Spencer Chamber, Historic Preservation Commission, Spencer Municipal Utilities, the City of Spencer, State of Iowa Library, and the Clay County Heritage Center. Enjoy. Thanks, Kara, for that nice introduction. And um, who was George Spencer? I think that's, that's the question. And, and if you look at this first slide, um, that doesn't tell you much because, I mean, it, it, there, that's a lot of accomplishment. But why did I want to uh, look into George Spencer? I think that's really the question a lot of people have asked me. And uh, being a former social studies teacher to uh, a few of the people in the audience, actually, uh, Nancy, Mark, Meredith. Uh, anyway, <coughs> um, I was interested and I knew that we had the sesquicentennial coming up. Um, and I was around for the centennial. I don't remember anybody really talking about George Spencer. And so I thought, well, I'm going to find out what this guy's all about. Because I'd always heard that he was just a scoundrel and good for nothing kind of guy. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll look into it. So after Christmas, COVID, retired. I started to do a little research. And uh, it really, it was, it was pretty fascinating what I found. Um, and I'll let you make up your own mind whether or not you think he was a scoundrel or something else uh, as we go along here tonight. But uh, Georgie e. Spencer did all of those things. And we'll talk a little bit, uh, or I will, about each one of those. So George Spencer was born in Champion, New York, uh, 1836. His father was a surgeon, had a medical practice in Champion. Uh, George was the youngest of four boys. Um, his father was actually a surgeon in the War of 1812 um, and uh, settled, and the Spencer family had been in New York since the 1600s. So they were well established, and uh, George um, grew up, obviously, in Champion, went to college in Montreal, at the University of Montreal, and uh, let's see if this pointer works. Montreal is about right there. It wasn't too far from Champion, uh, and he studied law. Now, I'm not quite sure how this all worked, but he uh, uh, came back to Champion after studying law for a year or something, uh, I'm not sure quite how that worked, but I know that uh, the uh, uh, legal profession wasn't what it is today. And he, he practiced law in Champion for about a year. Um, his father uh, was uh, uh, taken with the Republican Party. Now this is, by this time it's 1856. Uh, the, the Republican Party has started in 1854 and uh, the Spencers are very much in favor of the abolition part of the Republican Party. That's what gets them involved in the uh, Republican Party. Now, over here on the right is a flyer. And these flyers were all over the East. Because in the 1850s, 1840s, 1850s, land was opening up all across the West. And George Spencer obviously saw these flyers. He didn't want to stay in New York to make his, his fortune. And uh, he, he goes out to, uh, decides he's going to go to Iowa. And uh, so he does. He does. You know, go west, young man. And he's 19 years old. And he ends up in Newton, Iowa. Now, Newton was on the, uh, you think, well, Newton, why Newton? Newton was right basically 
well, it's not in the middle, but it's right on the Stagecoach Trail, Interstate 80, from Iowa City to Des Moines. And uh, in 1856, the capital of Iowa is in Iowa City, but they're in the process of moving the capital, the old beautiful capital uh, in Iowa City, to Des Moines. And um, George Spencer is going to find his fortune, sets up a little law practice in, in Newton, and uh, he has to go to Des Moines, and so he takes a stagecoach. And uh, I don't know how long it takes a stagecoach to get from Newton to Des Moines, but I think it's only about 30, 40 minutes from Des Moines to uh, Newton right now. But on this stagecoach is kind of the tipping point in George Spencer's life because he meets this guy. Whoops, sorry. Uh, Grenville Dodge. Grenville Dodge is a very well-known businessman, politician. Uh, he's very well connected, has um, several businesses in, in Iowa. He's connected in Iowa City, in Des Moines, and in Council Bluffs. And um, on this stagecoach ride, Spencer connects with Grenville Dodge. And uh, it's a friendship that lasts a lifetime. Um, the first Iowa State Capitol down here, whoops, uh, right here. Now, many of you have seen the, the old Capitol in Iowa City. This is what we moved to. But uh, some very well-connected entrepreneurs had some land on the Raccoon River, and they sold it to the state and moved the Capitol to Des Moines. But that's another story, okay? Um, so this... This whole stagecoach ride changes the course of George Spencer's life. So, as it happens, uh, George Spencer, I'll flip back to that last slide so we can get a better look at that old capital. Um, George Spencer uh, becomes, on the recommendation of Grenville Dodge, who's very well connected with the Republican Party in, in Iowa, uh, Spencer uh, is uh, asked to be the secretary of the Iowa Senate, okay? And he makes a lot of connections that way, political connections. And one of the connections he makes is with this guy, Orlando Howe. Now, that probably doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, and I think Tom, you're around, Tom Howe's here. He's no relation, evidently. Okay. Yeah, we... we <laughs> well, we thought he might have been a grandfather, but anyway, um, Orlando Howe, uh, Spencer gets involved in, now, obviously, Orlando Howe was about the same age as Spencer here. Uh, this is a much uh, later uh, portrait, but um, Spencer gets involved in a judicial election in 1857, uh, for Howe. Howe also had a, a law background, and uh, we elected judges in those days, and thank God we don't do that anymore. But anyway, that's a whole different deal, too. Um, but Howe loses the election, but Howe has just returned from Spirit Lake. He was on the expedition that chased Ink Paduta uh, and the Dakota out of the lakes area and into the Dakotas. Howe comes back to Newton and tells Spencer that there's a, there's a fortune to be made in northwest Iowa. So Spencer and Howe and two, three others, uh, one of Spencer's brothers, uh, Gustav, who uh, goes to Spirit Lake. He later goes to Hawaii. Smart guy. And uh, so uh, ends up in the sugarcane business. But... Um, Howe and Spencer, Spencer's brother and two others, go to Spirit Lake. And uh, with the intention of building a sawmill and building houses and, and that sort of thing. Well, Spencer decides that this is a pretty good deal. And uh, so they plat out, they hire a surveyor, they plat out Spirit Lake. Spencer travels down to... Uh, well, it's off the map here, but down to Sioux City takes seven days 
to uh, travel down to Sioux City. And what he does down in Sioux City, because all there was no courthouse, obviously, or anything like that in Spirit Lake, but he wants to get Spirit Lake established as the county seat of Dickinson County. So he, uh, he goes down, but while he's down there, he also petitions to get a post office in Spirit Lake. Because if you could get a post office in a small town in the 1800s, that was a big deal because the mail had to go somewhere and he had to have a central location. So he does that. He gets Spirit Lake designated as the uh, county seat. While he's down there, um, he uh, lays claim to 320 acres 20 miles south of Spirit Lake. Okay. And this is an old map, not quite as old as I would have liked, but this is an old map of Spencer and, or Sioux Township, actually. And this is Spencer's original claim that he made in Sioux City in 1857. And you can see this, the blue dot, whoops, the blue dot over here on the right is about where DeWolf Park is. And the blue dot on the left is about where Oneota is. About, okay? And those are the areas of Spencer's claim. Now, what Spencer does is he goes to Sioux City again, um, and he tries to get Spencer made the county seat. Well, we know that doesn't work out right away because Peterson is already the county seat, and, uh, and, and that's kind of an interesting deal too. But he does get a post office established, but there's no post office. There's no post office. So Spencer's got this land. He goes back up to Spirit Lake, and he builds a sawmill, and they, he does some business up there, but he becomes bored. And he decides, well, I'm going to sell. Now, by this time, it's 1858, 1859. And what he's going to do is uh, he, he um, uh, let's see, he's going to go to Colorado. Now, if you go to the county recorder's office here in Spencer, you can find all the sales that Spencer makes. And he sold the land. Um, I added it up. I added up the sales, and I think he made, he sold it all for about $3,300, okay? Now, that was quite a sum of money, though, in 1859, 1858, somewhere in there. And a lot of people say that when Spencer was selling this land, this is where the scoundrel part comes in, okay? They say that he made these flyers, similar to the ones, uh, one that I showed at the beginning, but on these flyers, supposedly, he marketed Spencer as a community that had churches, it had a post office, it had schools, it had streets, it had all kinds of things, okay? I've never been able to find any evidence of that. I haven't found any of the flyers or anything. So I'm not sure that that's true, but I do know that his marketing must have worked because what happened was there are people, and you can check this in the recorder's office, uh, the sales were from, to people from New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, um, a few from Newton, a couple from Spirit Lake, um, and, and places like that. So obviously his marketing worked, but he, he was a little bit bored and he was always on the move. So he uh, knows that there's gold in the, in the Rocky Mountains. So he decides he's going to use this $3,300. He goes to Council Bluffs, Grenville Dodge again. Grenville Dodge outfits him and 33 others, and he leads an expedition out to Colorado. It's the Colorado Gold Rush in 1859, and he's going to make his millions in the gold rush. So he settles... He goes into the Blue River Valley and uh, where uh, Breckenridge, Colorado is. Spencer uh, and his uh, party uh, settle in this area and he's always in a developmental uh, state of mind. 
So what he does is he goes to Washington, D.C., because he lays claim to 320 acres in the Blue River Valley, and he goes to D.C., and he's going to, he wants to get, he not only wants to get a post office in, in this community, but he wants to become the postmaster, okay? So what he does is he decides, well, how can I, what's the best way for me to get this claim adjusted and get the postmaster, the post office, and all that. Well, we'll just name the town after the vice president of the United States, John Breckinridge. So that's what he does. And he gets himself named postmaster. He comes back to Breckinridge. Um, here, I think I have a slide of, yeah, here's Breckinridge right now. That's what he came back to, okay? Uh, he developed a law practice in Breckinridge and he was the postmaster, and he invested in a salt mine. Now, one thing that I want you to I want to point out, this is Vice President Breckinridge, slaveholder, southerner. Notice how he spells his name. Notice Breckinridge, Colorado. A little different spelling. Well, the good folks of Breckinridge, Colorado, once the Civil War started, Breckinridge was uh, the presidential ca uh, candidate for the Democratic Party, one of two Democrats. There was a Northern Democrat, Stephen Douglas, and then James Breckinridge was the pro-slavery uh, Democrat in 1860. The people of Breckinridge, Colorado, wanted nothing to do with that, so they changed the spelling of the name of Breckinridge, Colorado. So that's why you have Breckinridge, Colorado spelled that, even though it's really named after John C. Breckinridge, okay? Okay, so he stays in Breckinridge for a little while, uh, and uh, General Dodge comes a-calling again, or Grenville Dodge. And Dodge has a better offer for Spencer. He uh, is uh, wanting to expand his business, and so what he does is he wants uh, Spencer to come back and uh, take over his business in St. Joe, Missouri. Now, it must have been a pretty good offer because Spencer had his law practice am among uh, guys who had several various claims and, and gold mines, and he was a postmaster, and he was making pretty good money. So Dodge must have offered him quite, quite a sum to come back to St. Joe. So he comes back to St. Joe, Missouri. This is 1860, okay? He doesn't stay in one place very long, I don't know, and he's like 24 years old at this time. So he comes back to St. Joe, Missouri, and about that time, Fort Sumter, April 1861. So this changes the whole trajectory uh, for George Spencer because what happens is that uh, Grenville Dodge, being very well connected in Iowa, is called upon in Council Bluffs to raise a regiment of infantry and a regiment of cavalry in western Iowa. So what he does is he contacts his good friend, George Spencer, to come up and help him recruit for this regiment. And Spencer does that, and he does a very good job, as he is wont to do. So then, after the regiment is raised, what happens is uh, he goes to Nebraska because the Nebraska Territory, Kansas was, um, uh, well, the whole Kansas-Nebraska Territory was split up at the time, and Nebraska was, was made its own specific territory. And President Lincoln appoints governor as governor Alvin Saunders. Now, Alvin Saunders needs a personal secretary. Alvin Saunders is a good friend of uh, Grenville Dodge. Alvin Saunders knows George Spencer from his time as secretary of the Iowa Senate. Alvin Saunders was a state senator in the Iowa Senate. So who does he ask? George Spencer becomes the secretary for Governor Saunders. So no, the Nebraska Territory is kind of out of the Civil War initially. However, uh, 
Lincoln needs troops. So Governor Saunders is asked to uh, raise a regiment. Who does he call on? George Spencer. George Spencer is called upon to recruit the 1st Nebraska Infantry. And uh, he does a pretty good job. He's got experience in this. And uh, after the 1st Nebraska is commissioned, uh, they were supposed to go out west and control the frontier and that sort of thing. But they were needed uh, for the, in, in the Civil War itself. So they are um, uh, to go to Missouri initially. Uh, Spencer gets commissioned to be the sutler of the regiment. Now, the sutler was really a big job because it was like a traveling general store and every regiment had a sutler. Now, they, they sold all kinds of things that the army didn't uh, provide. So, you know, if you wanted socks, you got socks from the sutler. If um, you, you wanted uh, um, uh, gloves or warmer coats or blankets or anything like that, you got it from the sutler. Uh, if you wanted coffee, you got it from the sutler. You wanted tobacco, you got it from the sutler. And you got your OB Joyful, which was alcohol, uh, from the sutler. So this is a pretty good gig for, for George. Um, and uh, the, the first Nebraska is attached to a division led by General Lew Wallace. Now, most of you probably don't know who General Lew Wallace was, but you know Charlton Heston. Okay, and Charlton Heston played Ben-Hur. And Lew Wallace wrote the novel Ben-Hur. Little fact, fun fact, okay? So, anyway, so... Um, uh, Spencer is, is attached to the 1st Nebraska as a sutler, and they're in the battles of Fort Donelson and the huge, bloody battle of Shiloh. Now, Spencer, um, after the battle of Shiloh, and by the way, uh, Granville Dodge is by now a general and is in the same area as the 1st Nebraska. Um, Spencer travels to Washington, D.C., because a lot of the people that he had accounts with are now dead. And he's petitioning the War Department that he, they should pay him because his, you know, the, the people that he had accounts with can't pay him, so he wants the government to pay him. And so he, uh, he goes to Washington. He's denied payment. He's not real happy about that. Um, but that's... That's what happens. But also while he's in, in D.C., he goes to see General Winfield Scott, who was in charge of all Union armies at the time. And uh, I don't know how he gets an audience with the commanding general of all Union armies, but he finagles his way in there, and he does. And he sings the praises of General Dodge. And he also, at this time, gets married. Now, I don't know when he's had any time to form any kind of relationships at all. But he gets married. This is in December of 1862. And he marries a woman by the name of Bella Zilfa. I love that name. And she is uh, a little bit younger than George. Well, George isn't too old at this time. But uh, she's a very prominent author and writer in, in her own right. So after his leave is over. Um, she stays in Washington, and he goes back to the front in Tennessee. So he's a little bit bored with being a sutler, and he was not too happy about being denied uh, payment. So he, um, uh, it just so happens that Grenville Dodge needs a chief of staff, and Spencer wants a little bit more action. So he gets commissioned captain in uh, the Union Army in uh, 1863. He becomes uh, General Grenville Dodge's chief of staff. Now, if you look at that picture, you'd think that he was the second in command, the way he's kind of positioning himself here. But uh, he's not. He's not. He's the chief of staff. Now, one of the things about Dodge during the Civil War was that he had this incredible intelligence operation. And he used Spencer as a spy. 
Now, here's a New Yorker. He doesn't have a Southern accent or anything like that. But the way that he used Spencer as a spy was Spencer was obviously talented in many areas. And there, they were all, all the time negotiating prisoner exchanges. So he sends Spencer on these prisoner exchanges deep into the South, into enemy territory. Well, while he's on these um, uh, prisoner exchange missions, what he's doing is he's talking to people in these little towns about where Confederate troops are and, and that sort of thing. Um, he even, he, there, there's one story where uh, he, he's on several of these missions and the Confederates don't figure out that he's giving information. I can't quite figure that out. But um, one of the, the stories is he, uh, he's in a Confederate camp late at night and he can't get back to his own camp, so the Confederates say, well, why don't you just stay over with us, basically. And he does. And he stays in their camp, and there, there's um, uh, some correspondence that talks about uh, how Spencer and the Confederates in that camp sat around the campfire. I'm sure they were enjoying some Obi Joyful, um, but they, they were talking about the reason for secession, they talked about the freedmen's rights. Um, they were talking about how the war was going to end and, and all that sort of thing. So he's kind of an interesting, interesting character there. Um, so then he, he's very good at what he does, and he's asked to conduct another mission. And this one is he's asked by Dodge. This is in... Uh, late 1862, 1863, he's asked to become a recruiter again, but this time he's going to recruit Alabamians for the Union Army. Now, you know, it sounds kind of strange that Alabama would, would uh, have a Union regiment, but if you look at this part of Alabama, this northern part, now the U the Union Army, where Spencer was, was in this part of Mississippi, the northeast corner. And this part of Alabama, the hill country of Alabama, was not in favor of secession. When Alabama voted in 1861 on secession, that whole area and this little area down here where Mobile is, voted against secession. Mobile was the largest city in Alabama at the time and uh, had a large population of freed blacks and uh, a lot of Creoles. It was kind of the New Orleans of uh, Alabama at the time. But that northern part of Alabama was very much anti-Confederate and anti-secession. So Dodge felt that there was, um, there, there could be a lot of uh, uh, people who might want to uh, be involved in the, the uh, Union Army. And they were, and they were being harassed anyway by the, the Confederacy had instituted a draft by this time, and so the, uh, many of those people didn't want to be in the Confederate Army, and they were forced into it, or their families were harassed, and things like that. And a lot of them looked at this as a way to get back at the Confederacy. Now, you can, uh, uh, let's see, this right here is a picture of some of the first Alabama. Now, notice that there are a couple of uh, black soldiers in that picture, and they did recruit some of the uh, freed blacks or uh, the uh, slaves who had escaped at that time were recruited for the first Alabama. So, it was an integrated unit even though in most of the Union Civil War regiments, they fought in segregated units. And in many cases, they were not allowed uh, to, well, we've heard of the 56th Massachusetts, I think, but most of them were involved in things other than um, actual uh, fighting uh, regiments. But so uh, Spencer and the 1st Alabama are, Basically, let me see, I want to go back one here. Uh, Spencer and the 1st Alabama um, are involved with General Dodge again, um, and they are 
very much involved in the battle for Atlanta, uh, the uh, gone with the wind kind of thing, okay? Um, and during the uh, march on Atlanta, Spencer gets sick, gets dysentery, which was pretty common. But Spencer's cure, now remember his father was a doctor, Spencer's cure for dysentery was opium and boiled milk. Yeah. I don't know much about either. <laughs> so can't really say whether it was cured. But he lived to tell about it. So anyway, um, the, uh, uh, the first Alabama was very much involved in, in that whole uh, fight for Atlanta, but they were much more involved in Sherman's march to the sea. Uh, General Sherman, by this time, has uh, taken over the Army of the Tennessee, which uh, was the Southern Army. Grant has taken over the uh, Army in the uh, northern part and the eastern part of the, the uh, war. And uh, Sherman uh, and his army are going to march on Savannah. And I think, you know, we've all heard this quote, in various forms, War is Hell by General uh, Sherman, but it certainly was, and uh, Spencer and the First Alabama certainly made it that way. Um, and this, this picture, I think, really depicts a lot of what uh, uh, went on during that time. One of the things, uh, you'll see they destroyed every railroad that they could possibly destroy, and they would pick up, they, they would take the rails and they would uh, uh, form them, they'd bend them, and they'd call them Sherman neckties, uh, so that they were uh, totally in, uh, inusable, unusable. And uh, the first Alabama was sent out ahead of the main part of the army. And what they, you know, you've heard about how they destroyed uh, Property. Well, they were to destroy public property, all. Um, they, they destroyed towns, they destroyed railroads, uh, they stole uh, farm animals, anything, because Sherman's army was really feeding itself off of the South at the time, and the first Alabama was, was a, a great part of that. But one of the things that they also did is they plundered and pillaged private property as well. And one of the things, Sherman um, had them out there because he felt that the, the Southerners would know where other Southerners were likely to hide things uh, when they knew that the army was coming. So when they'd go on to plantations and things like that, they knew where they would hide their valuables. And so there was an awful lot of really bad things that were going on. So during this time, Spencer gets reprimanded for the conduct of his uh, regiment um, because there was an order by General Kilpatrick, and we'll get to him in a little bit too, uh, that you weren't supposed to do that. And uh, Spencer's regiment was. Uh, General Sherman refused to act on the reprimand. So it tells you something about, about uh, Sherman too, I think. Um, anyway, so one of the things as they're moving forward to Savannah, uh, the first Alabama is on a road going into Savannah. They're about 20 miles out. And landmines were first used in the Civil War. And on this road were several landmines, and the first Alabama uh, has some casualties as a result of these landmines. So Spencer stops the, the regiment and Let's uh, uh, the uh, sends a uh, message back to Sherman about what to do because they're leading the, the entire vanguard at this time. Sherman comes up with a detachment of prisoners and puts them on the road in front of the first Alabama. Now, the Confederate prisoners are very upset about this, as you might imagine, uh, and uh, but. Sherman, war is hell, um, too bad. And uh, several of the Confederates lost their lives on those landmines, in those, uh, due to those landmines. Anyway, so um, the uh, first Alabama, and by the way, Sherman had great praise for 
uh, George Spencer. He said that uh, the 1st Alabama and George Spencer were, were the best cavalry regiment in the Union Army. Now, whether that's true or not, but who am I to uh, say anything that, about General Sherman? Okay, now, when Sherman enters Savannah, um, he enters Savannah just before Christmas in 1864, and he is, uh, has the 1st Alabama Regiment and George Spencer lead the troops, lead the army into Savannah, which was quite an honor for uh, Spencer and the 1st Alabama. And uh, Sherman presents Savannah as a Christmas present to President Lincoln. So, after Savannah, the uh, first Alabama and, the, and Sherman's army moved their way through South Carolina. And if you thought that uh, Georgia was bad with regard to pillaging and plundering, South Carolina was worse because Sherman felt that uh, they were the cause of the Civil War and uh, being the first uh, state to secede. And so they took no mercy on South Carolinians. Um, once they got into North Carolina, they backed off. But the last major conflict that uh, the first Alabama is involved in is the Battle of Monroe's Crossroads. Now, the first Alabama is, and by this time, Spencer has been uh, promoted to colonel, and uh, he has several regiments under his command, but um, they're under the full command of Kilpatrick, who he was with in Georgia as well. So they're camped at Monroe's Crossroads. General Kilpatrick um, was quite a ladies' man, and uh, he was uh, the entire army, uh, or the entire that part of the army, camped at Monroe's Crossroads. Um, Kilpatrick is entertaining that night uh, a couple of camp followers. And um, early in the morning, the Confederate cavalry uh, attacks them by surprise at Monroe's Crossroads. And everybody's surprised. The Union, um, the 1st Alabama and the Union Army uh, retreat back into a swamp. Kilpatrick is in the one house that there was in Monroe's Crossroad comes out in his uh, evening wear, I guess you would say, and the uh, Confederates want Kilpatrick because Kilpatrick didn't have a good reputation among the Confederates, and they're, they're asking, where's Kilpatrick? He doesn't look like a general in his nightgown, and he says, he went that away, and then he runs back into the swamp, and where General, or Colonel Spencer is reorganizing the regiments to make a counterattack on General Hampton, the Confederate general, who has taken Monroe's crossroads. And uh, so because of this, because of Colonel Spencer's meritorious and gallant behavior, General Kilpatrick, who was caught with his pants down, um, uh, says that uh, he commends Spencer for bravery and meritorious service, and he is given um, the, uh, a very nice Medal of Honor award. Uh, but some say it's just to protect his reputation more than anything else. But Spencer did uh, retake the camp and chase the Confederates off at Monroe's Crossing, and he recommends to General Grant that uh, Spencer be promoted to Brigadier General. And so at the end of the war, the last few months of the uh, Civil War, uh, Spencer was a uh, uh, general. Um, he was honorably discharged after the war on July 5th, of 1865. But that's not the end of George. So George doesn't know what to do. A lot of people say he should go back to Alabama because, you know, the South, uh, the, the Southerners, the Confederates can't vote. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff going on down there that he should go back to Alabama and start a law practice and uh, he'd have a natural constituency of his Alabama regiment. 
But he and Bella decide to go to San Francisco. And oh, by the way, Bella is now the editor of the Saturday Evening Post. So she's pretty talented in her own right. So they go to San Francisco. He's going to start a law practice in San Francisco. And Bella uh, is going to take a world tour um, through the Saturday Evening Post. And she's going to file her dispatches from various locations. And George is just going to wait for her in San Francisco. Well, they don't do that. Um, and instead, they both move back to Alabama to Huntsville, Alabama uh, area, where he sets up a law practice. And uh, he becomes a cotton buyer. Well, you'd have to put quotes around cotton buyer. Um, there was a lot of uh, confiscated cotton in Alabama at that time. And he knew a lot of textile people, um, buyers up in New England through his contacts in the Civil War. And so he gets a hold of this cotton. We'll say that he bought it. And then he sells it to these uh, textile merchants uh, up in New England, and uh, he makes a, a good deal of money uh, uh, doing this. He also becomes a bankruptcy judge. There are a lot of bankruptcies. The South is in depression at the time. But in order to become a bankruptcy judge, you had to be appointed by a federal judge at that time. And there was uh, the federal judge in Alabama uh, was a guy by the name of Busteed, Judge Busteed. Anyway, Judge Busteed was facing impeachment charges for selling judgeships. So, um, and supposedly, uh, well, Spencer was one of those judges. And uh, the... Uh, uh, the, the going rate for a judge was $1,000, okay? And the Congress was investigating him to see whether or not they should impeach him, and they, they call Spencer to, in to testify, and yeah, he gave Judge Busteed $1,000, but he never said that it was in, you know, a kickback to get the judgeship. What Spencer said was, yeah, I gave him $1,000 because Judge Busteed and all federal judges are overworked and underpaid. And this was just my way of showing them my appreciation for their service. Um, and uh, Judge Busteed, a little side, you probably need to know what happened to Judge Busteed. Uh, he was not impeached. He was a Republican. The Republicans had control of the House and the Senate and decided that there was nothing there. Nothing there. Okay? So... Um, and then on a sad note, the reason Bella did not go on the world tour is because uh, she was pregnant. And uh, that's the reason that they moved back to Alabama. And she dies of typhoid fever, though, in 1867, and the baby dies as well. So this kind of sets Spencer back for a few days. <coughs> And he is, uh, Spencer then, in 1868, uh, he's elected senator from Alabama. Now, he's only 31 years old. Up to that time, he was, the, at that time, he was the youngest senator um, elected in 18, he was the youngest senator in the Senate at that time. There were two others who were a little bit younger than him who had been elected before uh, that, but he's in the like the top 10 of youngest people ever elected to the U.S. Senate. And he, he definitely was a carpetbagger. And you have to understand, too, that we didn't elect senators with a popular election, okay? I don't want to go too much U.S. government class here, but uh, we, the state legislatures elected U.S. senators up until uh, 1914, 1912, something like that. And... So the state legislatures. Now, the South was solidly Democratic prior to the Civil War, and it was after Reconstruction, too. But there, the, the Confederates couldn't vote, and so there was a natural 
the natural constituency was for the Republicans to take over. And the, the uh, newly freed blacks who were entitled to vote uh, were primarily Republicans because of Abraham Lincoln and because their former masters were Democrats. So they um, uh, formed um, the, a core constituency of the Southern and especially the Alabama Republican Party. Now, Spencer decides he's going to run for the Senate and um, he's a carpetbagger. Carpetbaggers were the Northerners who went down to the South and, uh, um, and either got made uh, money in po politics or business. And he was, a, he was more of a radical Republican. Um, there were two branches of the Republican Party at that time. There was the conservative Republicans and the radical Republicans. And just to, uh, the conservatives wanted uh, uh, to make the South's entry back into the Union a little easier. The radical Republicans wanted to punish the South uh, more so than the conservatives did. So um, Spencer's coalition of uh, uh, getting elected was the Northern Alabamians, who he had a great affinity for, and they had a great affinity for him, and the newly freed blacks, um, especially in what they call the Black Belt of Alabama, which is, goes from like Montgomery through Selma and over to the Mississippi border. Um, and the, the, the biggest battles, and there was another Republican senator elected at the time, Willard Warner, who was also a general in the Civil War. He's from Ohio. He was a little more well-connected with um, President Grant, who was also elected in 1868. Um, and uh, Spencer and Warner never got along. Uh, because uh, Warner controlled most of the patronage. Now, I'm not going to say that there were kickbacks going on, you know, because of this patronage, but there were kickbacks going on as a result of patronage jobs in the 1860s and 70s. So Spencer complained that Warner got about five-sixths of the patronage jobs, uh, federal patronage jobs in Alabama, and you know, he, he, was, he didn't like that. And so, and Warner was tied to the governor, the newly elected Republican governor of Alabama, a guy by the name of Smith, whose brothers had all fought for Spencer uh, during the Civil War. And so Spencer was at odds with both of, both of them. So um, Spencer, this Warner, this is kind of interesting. Um, well, I'll back up, Warner, has to run for re-election in 1870. They were staggering the terms to get them back on track. And Spencer campaigns against Warner, Republican against Republican. Um, Ronald Reagan's uh, rule didn't apply, I guess, back then. But anyway, um, so he's, he's campaigning against Warner, but what happens is that a Democrat gets elected as a result uh, because Spencer despises Warner so much that he gets some of his Republican state senators and state legislators to vote for the Democrat rather than vote for Warner. But the real reason was so he could have control of the patronage jobs and not Warner because he knew that the federal patronage jobs would still be Republican because they had a Republican president, okay? So anyway, he runs for re-election in 1872, and it's a disputed election. And this is crazy. Disputed election? Who would ever think that we would have a disputed election? 1872. So there, there are two sets of returns. One set of returns favors a Democratic legislature. And as soon as those returns are, are found, those Democrats take a hold of the Alabama State House in Montgomery. Well, there's another set of returns that show the Republicans winning. And all of those people take office, hold office, in the courthouse in Montgomery. It's called the courthouse legislature. Okay, so Spencer, you know, thinks obviously that the courthouse legislature is the legitimate one. So they have to appoint a commission to decide 
which of these election results are the right ones. So the Congress um, was controlled by the Republicans in, uh, in uh, 1872. And so what happens is they appoint a commission, four Republicans and three Democrats. And lo and behold, I mean, just, you know, you've, I'm sure you're aghast that, that it turned out to be four to three for the Republican election results. So Se Senator Spencer re retains his seat in the uh, U.S. Senate, okay? So then, the, the, but, but the Democrats, and there's a Democrat governor who's elected, he wants the, uh, uh, the legislature in Alabama to investigate Spencer for uh, misuse of power and it doesn't go anywhere. So while Spencer is in the, in the Senate during his second term, there are two things that he works very, very diligently on. He, he also, he's the uh, committee chair of military affairs, um, but what he really does for Alabama is he works for civil rights. Um, he worked for um, blacks having the right to vote and not being intimidated uh, in their right to vote. He campaigned on keeping federal troops in Alabama so that blacks could vote. Now, you know, they were part of his constituency. So naturally he would be for that, but he didn't have to be. But he also campaigned for equal education. Um, at that time um, in, the, um, in Alabama, blacks were not allowed to go to school and he campaigned and fought hard for the right for blacks to uh, have an equal education. Now, it ends up being a segregated education, but an equal education, okay? He was also an opponent of the KKK. The KKK started in about 1868, and they were notorious not only for attacking uh, the, the newly freed slaves, but also those northern Alabamians who Spencer um, uh, fought with and fought for. Uh, and, and the KKK hated those people because they were pro-union. And uh, there are so many just awful stories of what the KKK did uh, to uh, uh, the people in northern Alabama. Now, interestingly enough, in the Black Belt, in Alabama, the KKK was not as powerful because blacks outnumbered whites in many of those counties. And they formed, the blacks in those counties formed a organization, an organization called the Black Cavalry, which fought against the KKK. So it was almost like a mini civil war within Alabama after the Civil War uh, was over. Anyway, Spencer was uh, very much um, an opponent of the KKK. He tried to get the governor to establish a militia to fight the KKK. Um, he he uh, was very much a proponent of keeping federal troops in Alabama to uh, fend off the uh, KKK as well, okay? So in 1876, um, Rutherford B. Hayes is uh, elected president in another disputed election, by the way, uh, which was decided by another commission of, uh, well, this was five Republicans and four Democrats, and the Republicans won. Anyway, so, but one of the, one of the stipulations in that uh, disputed election was that Hayes basically made a compromise to pull all federal troops out of Alabama, basically ending Reconstruction. And as a result, Spencer felt that he had no um, future in Alabama politics, so he decides early on then not to run. But in uh, 1877, this is a headline from the Cincinnati Inquirer, the surrender of Senator Spencer. He got married to a very interesting woman, uh, May Nunez. Her actual name was William May Nunez. Um, her uh, uh, William, she got her name William from uh, her uncle, who was a general in the Egyptian army. 
I don't know. Anyway, uh, and uh, she, um, she was quite an interesting woman in her own right. She was an author and an actress. Um, and, oh, by the way, they, they get married in 1877, and they, uh, like a lot of people, they take their honeymoon to the Black Hills. This is a year after Custer's Last Stand. I don't think they had wall drug. I'm not sure, but uh, they... Oh, maybe they did, Bob. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Uh, so he, he, marries, he marries May Nunez in 1877. Um, and as I said, she's uh, quite, the, quite the author um, and uh, actress, well-known actress. Her, uh, her father was from Spain. Um, her, and her uncle in the Egyptian army and was also in the Confederate army, I guess. And, and she wrote, uh, one of the, the books that she wrote was um, entitled Dennis Day Carpetbagger. I think it was, uh, she was referring to her husband, actually. Um, so anyway, uh, he retires from the Senate in 1878, uh, and they moved to Nevada where he in, uh, buys a ranch, invests in uh, gold and silver mines in, in Nevada, and doesn't stay out in Nevada very long because Grenville Dodge comes calling again. Grenville Dodge by this time is the um, head of the Union Pacific Railroad, the chief engineer, uh, all of that, and asks Spencer if he'd be interested in becoming a commissioner for the Union Pacific Railroad. And uh, in 1883, they moved to, back to Washington, D.C. And not much is known um, about uh, uh, Spencer in those years, his years in Washington, D.C. He dies at the age of 56 um, in 1893. Uh, May does not remarry. She uh, continues on writing, and she uh, has a vaudeville career. Uh, and and uh, she lives until 18 t or 1921, I believe. Um, Spencer was buried or is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. He uh, was uh, buried with full military honors. And I really need to thank these people. Um, Mike Fitzgerald. Uh, when I was doing the research uh, on George Spencer, uh, I, I don't know, I don't even know how I ran across Mike, um, but he and I have had quite a bit of correspondence. He's a professor at St. Olaf College, and he's the, a nationally renowned scholar on Reconstruction and probably knows more about Alabama Reconstruction than anybody in the country, now, how that happens and he ended up at St. Olaf, I'm not sure. And then this guy on the right, Terry Seip, who is a professor emeritus uh, at the University of Southern California. And uh, he's also a Reconstruction Civil War historian. But Fitzgerald gave me Seip's name because he said, I think he's doing some research on George Spencer. And turns out he's writing a biography of George Spencer. And... Uh, uh, but he says he's got several other projects that he's working on during his retirement, too. So uh, we don't know when that book is coming out. So, but it will be. So anyway, um, George Spencer, scoundrel? I don't know. <laughs> uh, there's uh, a lot of evidence both ways, I guess. So anyway, thank you very much. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd, I'd take some questions, too. Unless we don't have time. Kara, what do you think? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, the question, did uh, Spencer spend any time here, live in Spencer? No, he actually spent more time in Spirit Lake, yeah, than Spencer. Um, he just uh, gave his name. It's actually Spencer's Grove, uh, because in those days, if you put the grove on the end of a town name, it meant trees might be more attractive to uh, potential buyers. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, he did, in, when he was out in Colorado, he, there's some correspondence between him and, or maybe it was when he was in Council Bluffs, between him and uh, 
Orlando Howe, about coming back into the area. But there's some kind of, uh, uh, it's a kind of weirdly stated about, don't tell anybody that I might be coming back. Now, I don't know if he had some debts outstanding or what, but uh, who knows? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I haven't done any research on the, the people who bought the land. Um, I have their names. I should have written those down, the people that, uh, that bought the land. None of them st stuck out to me as people that, that yeah, that, that, you know, I remember, you know, from my years in Spencer or anything. Any old Spencer names. Yeah. Yeah, Mark. Yeah, there's. I think you're right on that because I think if you um, check the, and I don't know if it was Grettinger or the Emmitsburg area in that, but I, you know, there's somebody over in that area bought one of his claims. I know that. Yeah, yeah. The first, yeah, I think the first sod home is out there by DeWolf Park. Was out there by DeWolf Park. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, there's not much real, actual, physical uh, connection that Spencer has here, but his name lends itself to, you know, there, there are 22 uh, cities named Spencer in, in the United States. Two are named after George Spencer. Yeah, this, uh, Iowa and Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you everyone for attending tonight. Um, for more information on Flag Fest and the 150th celebrations, please pick up a booklet and a flyer on your way out. And thank you to Steve. That was super interesting. So.